Uh, this morning, I, I want us to turn in our Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Seal, if you could... Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, if I could have my Bible in my bag, please. Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is giving the, the people of Israel, he's giving his disciples, not just his disciples, but all those that came listening. And throughout those chapters of uh, 4, 5, 6, we see Jesus speaking the Sermon of the Mount and what he starts to say to people. Forgive me, I'm just trying to do this with one hand. Jesus starts to speak. With chapter 5, Jesus is talking to the people about the Beatitudes. And Jesus is coming into a world that has already had its, its paradigm shaped. It's already had its viewpoint set. It, it was waiting for a Messiah. They didn't believe Jesus was going to be the Messiah. They didn't know anything. And Jesus comes in and he starts to challenge their thoughts. Who likes their thinking to be challenged? No. No. We do, some of us do, most of us don't. We don't want it to be challenged, but it's good for things to be challenged. It's good because with that challenging of our revelation, we get to learn new things that come in. And Jesus comes in and he starts to tell them about the Beatitudes. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. In chapter 5, he comes in and he said that Christ will fulfill the law. And then he says murder begins at the heart. What a turn. Really? You're talking about Beatitudes? Uh, and you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Oh, and by the way, if you've got murder in your heart, it's, it's what's not just what you do, it's what's in your heart. Because he's highlighting what's in your heart. Um, he does the same thing with adultery. And he starts to talk about that because at the time, there were so many uh, men who were just giving their wives certificates of divorce. And he was saying, even though you're doing what the law requires, I say to you, if a man and even looks at another woman in last, he's already committed adultery. He lifted the bar right up in everything. He talks about how marriage is sacred. He talks about uh, oaths and going the extra mile, doing the extra thing. And while the law said that they would have to walk and do things, Jesus goes further with that in what they're doing. And then he turns around and says, love your enemies, do good. And he says, do good to God, do what's pleasing to God. And then right through, he talks about prayer and in, in, oh, sorry, not enough hands. In chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus says this. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them are you not of more value than they? And he starts to talk about worry. Are you not of more value than the birds of the air? Are you not of more value than what is around you? And Jesus shares these things. Did it come up on the screen? No. Now it is. Yes. Are you not of more value? See, what does we consider valuable? I was reading through Solomon this week, and uh, I've always... No matter how many times I read it, I'm amazed at when the Bible starts to say there was that much gold that came to Solomon that silver meant nothing. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine so much gold coming in, silver, pff, who wants it? Let's just, you can have the silver, we'll leave it for other people. Because there's that much gold and so silver became not as much value, that's for sure, as what gold was. What does it take and what determines the value of something? I found that quite easily it's what someone is prepared to pay for it. What determines the value, have you ever noticed that when you're selling something, you put a price up on it and you say, this is worth, this is worth $200. Oh, I've jumped the gun. This thing's gone crazy. You put the price up and you say, you say, oh, this is worth $200, and someone says, oh, I'm not paying $200, I'll give you $100. But it's worth $200. No, I don't want to give you $200. It's worth more to you because it's yours, but not as worth as much to someone else. And there are a lot of things that we have in value. I mean, I, I really value the Bible. I really value it. But as a physical Bible, I like this Bible. It's good. It's a new, it's a new King James Version. I've written in it. But while I value this Bible, 
Thank you, Seal. While I value this Bible, I've got another Bible that I value way more than that. And that's this Bible. Not because it's the New American Standard. I actually prefer reading the New King James. But I started reading this so many years ago that I just won't change. But what's valuable about this Bible to me is it's got written in there references, quotes. It's got written in there comments. And my delight in there is it's got written in there prayer points for my children. It's got written there that I might write, see something read in there and I would go, this is for you, David. This is for you, Danny. This is for you, Sarah. So that one day when they open this Bible and they flick through it, it won't just be empty pages. This Bible means a lot to me. It means a lot because of what's written in there. But yet, it's still just paper. Because I can get another Bible and I can transfer everything that I've written into that Bible and start again. If you want taking that. But something that's worth more than that is this watch. You won't be able to see it on camera. But trust me, it's a nice watch. This watch that I'm wearing today, I usually like wearing my other watch because it tells me that I've done a lot of exercise just by playing the guitar because of the hand movement. <laughs> it says, well done. Thank you. <laughs> but this watch means a lot to me because this watch was bought, to me, bought, to me, uh, bought for me by my three children on our 25th wedding anniversary. And Seal and I had uh, similar watches and it's worth a bit of money. They spent a bit of money on us and uh, they bought this watch and this watch is very valuable. I'd pay a lot for this watch if I had to get it back. But I got another watch which is worth more. It doesn't work, although it could work. I've just got to change the battery. The band's broken, as you can see. It's a Seiko. The band's broken, but this watch actually means a lot more to me than this watch. And do you know why? Seal knows why. Because this is the first watch my girlfriend or my fiance, I'm not really sure, bought me. The year was 1980-something. This is the watch that my first watch that sealed, my first gift that seal bought me. And I've kept it. It does work. I just think it's just got to put a battery in it. So this watch is even more valuable to me. But then there's something else that's more valuable to me. And I've given you the punchline already. And that's these amazing kids and the dog. <laughs> these amazing kids. They mean the world to me. And I would give even more in anything. Who, what parent would not give anything for their child? And you would do that so they mean everything to me. That's the value that I place. And you can't put a figure on that. You can't put an amount on it. And, and I, I know you can already see the, the similarities. Go, well, how much more did God love us that he not just didn't, he sent his son to die for us. That's how valuable we are to God. That's how valuable you are to God. Because we know that God is our protector. We know that God is the one who covers us. He is our banner. And he is our everything that, that forms over us because he loves us. Remember, Jesus didn't die because you sinned. He died because he died because sin was in the world. But he died because he loves you. The Father loves you. The Father loves you. And because he loves you and because a price had to be paid, he sent his son. For God so loved the world, as we know what it says. But God knows how to bring the value in us out. But sometimes when God moves on this journey of us understanding how we are valued in him, it doesn't always go along with the pattern that we think. And I want us to look at something this morning. Let's turn in our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 7, please. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. And it says in there, You shall not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God. The children of Israel are about to move in and, and they're dealing with 
how they're going to get into the promised land. And God starts to tell them because they're terrified of the people who are in the land. They're terrified of the giants. They're terrified of what's facing them. And God says, the great, I am the great and awesome God. He is your great and awesome God. He is your great and awesome God. And I think we forget that and we know it, but we have to carry that revelation in our heart that he is the great and awesome God is among you. He's among you. And the Lord your God, who? Who? The Lord your God, the Lord my God, will drive out those nations before you. What does it say next? Little by little. I'm not too fussed on those words. Little by little. And then it says, you will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. The great and awesome God is with you, helping you move into your promised land. God tells them they're not going to take. He's not going to take all your land at once. He's not going to move you into something all at once that he's going to do it little by little. And in this world where everything is instant, and I have to admit patience isn't one of my strong points, please never pray that prayer to God. He will answer that one very quickly if you say, teach me patience. He's got a way of just holding you back. And, and, and God is there in this place, in this world. We have to understand that in God, everything is moving in a season. There's a reason the scripture tells us that God says little by little. And it says it's because otherwise the beasts of the field become too numerous for them. It's interesting that first of all, God didn't allow them to enter into the promised land because the sin or the iniquity of the people living in the land, that God's grace was still there until it reached its full measure. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield, The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Do you not realize it's it's a word that he speaks over you? For the Lord God is your sun and shield. The Lord God will give you grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Thank the Lord that we are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That no good thing will God withhold from me, but it's in his time and how he does things. God has every good thing for us. And this is the big thing that we have. This is probably our biggest statement when we know God is good. We know he has things for us. We know he's got things planned. But when? Who said, but when? Who's ever cried out, come on God, but when? When are we going to see the breakthrough? When are we going to see the release? When are we going to see the promises? When are we going to see the prayers answered? When are we going to see the healing? When are we going to see what you've said? When are we going to see we're moving forward and diligently and diligently as best as we can? But when? I don't know about you, but I ask that question a lot. We always think it's going to happen quick. We always think that it's going to be straight away. When I got my sea do my jet ski, they get you two skis. They're two keys, I should say. This key is the normal key. This key will let you open the throttle right up and you can go and go as fast as you want. But this key is for beginners. This is the key we give Tim because he's not used to speed. <laughs> This key, this key is for beginners. This key will only let the acceleration, no matter how much you pull on the throttle, no matter how much you want and will the sea do to go faster, it will not go any faster than what it's programmed to do because of this key. That's why I don't take this key. <laughs> but if, when Seal was riding, I actually thought maybe I should get the key out and let Seal have the beginner's key. So, it, and, and basically what it is, it's a governor. We all understand what a governor is. It just puts a limitation on things and and it holds it back. And there's so much in our lives when we look at things that God does is he puts the governor on our lives. And it's something that we don't want, but God has a purpose and a plan because he loves you 
because you're valuable to Him. But we're saying, but when, Lord? But when? When are we going to see the breakthrough? And sometimes you can even feel the governor of God just holding us back and holding us back. And there's purpose for that. And we're going to look at that. And most of the time, the answer to the question of but when isn't so much the why, it's the what. It's God. It's your loving Heavenly Father. See, God doesn't love us for what we do, but for who we are. That what we do should always flow out of who we are. See if this comes up. What we want to do should always, always be overshadowed by who we want to be. I think so much in ministry and in doing things for God, we get the cart before the horse and we think, if people could just see how gifted I am, if people could just see how talented I am, if people could just see what I could do for God, I wouldn't be cleaning up. I'd be the one up the front. Pastor would be asking me to speak and, and they'll be calling me up to come and pray at the altar if they could just see what I could do. But who you are is always more important. Because God loves you and so much. And when he's doing things in your life and he's working things in your life, he will always move according to how he sees you and who you are, not just what you think you want to be. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. When he's talking about the signs and the wonders. And Jesus says, don't rejoice in the signs and wonders. Don't rejoice that you laid hands on someone and someone went, Phew! and the anointing hit them and they fell down and you went, woohoo, look at that. I just touched someone and the Holy Spirit hit them and they fell down. Don't rejoice in the giftings that you have, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice that your name is in heaven. Matthew's gospel, I think, gives us a, an amazing example of getting things the wrong way. In Matthew chapter 7, you know, Jesus, uh, Matthew writes this sobering statement in Matthew seven twenty two. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What a sobering statement that is. That, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We laid hands on people. We cast demons out in your name. We saw miracles happen in your name and people got touched by you. But if there's no relationship with the Lord, if there's no connection with Jesus, with the Father, Jesus' response is, is just a terrifying thought. It's a terrifying thought. Get away from me. I didn't know you. Words that I don't ever want to see anyone hear those words. And Jesus is showing in this, if you get it the wrong way around, if you're pushing to get what you want and your prayers answered and how you think it'll go, you're running a risk. You're running a risk of getting the gift before the relationship. But it's the relationship that is paramount. God is not impressed by what we do if we're not growing in our relationship with him. Your value and your worth in him is worth far more than anything you can do. And that's why fruit is far more important than self-manufacturing. Fruit is more important than what you can do out of yourself. Who you are is always more valuable to God than what you do. But I, I'm not saying that as an excuse to say, well, I don't have to do anything. Because it's quite the opposite. Because I looked, if we're valuable to God, and you're valuable to God, does that give me a response? Do I have to respond to that? Do I have a responsibility in Christ to move beyond what I'm doing because God said you are valuable to me? Yes, it does. The Bible speaks of several things, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. What are we created to do? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That if you are valuable to God and you are worthy to God, then God has called you to respond to that and you have a responsibility to love God before self and others. To love God first. Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Teacher, 
Which is the most important commandment of the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second commandment is equally important. Love your neighbour as yourself. And he says the entire law and the prophet, entire law and ever of the prophets is based on these two commandments. And Jesus is telling him, love God first. You know, I think if there was a microscope, a magnifying glass, I should say, placed in our life that exposed things. And, you know, with all the things you would have seen in the news um, with a certain organisation that has um, just facing some certain troubles at the moment. And I remember saying to Seal, when we're watching the new person who's in charge, I said, I can't fathom, I can't comprehend every word of my, my life being examined. Would you like to live in a place where every single your word of yours, every single thing was played backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards until they find someone find, finds what they want to accuse you? Would you like every message you said, everything you prayed, everything you'd had, laid open bare for the world to see and know exactly what is in your heart? That's a sobering statement. Sobering thing. And so God is saying, love me first. Don't love your leisure first. Don't love your activities first. Don't love your family first. Don't love your work first. Don't love what you want to do first. Love me first. Love me first. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Love me first. There's another responsibility that we have because we're valued and we are worthy. And that is to preach the gospel. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That we have a responsibility to preach the gospel, doing it in a different way, like Seal's friend at work, being able to share Christ in a way. Not everyone has to preach the old King James Version. Thus says the Lord, you shall love him. You don't have to preach like that. It's preaching like you. It's sharing like you and how you are and allowing the word to come out. We're also called to help other believers. And as I said, we need to love them out of hell. Galatians 6. Dear brothers and sisters, if any believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens in a world where everything is trying to go it alone. Where everyone thinks they can do it on their own. And everyone thinks they've got the key, they've got the knowledge, they've got the ability. We don't. We're not designed to. We're designed to work together, build together, form things together, rely on one another. And if you see your brother or your sister in sin, in love, sharing things, do what is good. There's a responsibility to do what is good because of God's grace. Uh, in Titus 3, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient always, ready to do what is good. And it continues on. There's also a responsibility to defend others in need. Proverbs 31, 8, 9. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. There's a responsibility in that. In, valued as individuals because we are part of the body of Christ. We're valued as, as I'm valued as me, but I was also valued because I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm part of what he has and who he says as the bride that a hand cannot work on its own. A foot cannot work on its own. It has to work together as one. I find so often that we, we segregate and pull things apart and go, yes, yes, it's not just about that ministry. It's not just about that thing. We just got to work in God together. And, and church, I hope that you never confuse my zeal for seeing God do miracle signs and wonders. I hope you never confuse it and mistake it for that that is the pinnacle and that is the goal. No, it's not. It's working together. It's working as the body, as the bride of Christ, working together in Him. 
We're valued with God's governor over our life. His Holy Spirit isn't just a dunamis power. His Holy Spirit is our teacher and our guide. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. When Tim and Beck's son, Oscar, turns 12, Tim is not going to give him the keys to the HSV. He's not going to give him the keys and say, well, he might. <laughs> he might. You're not going to give your kid something that you know is too powerful for them. You're not going to give your child something you know that is too dangerous for them. We allow them to grow. And I think that's the challenge as parents. That so often it's that reverse funnel that we want to harness everything in when they're younger. And as they get older, it's learning how to release things in their lives and learning how to let them take on more responsibility and take on more things. And that's what it's like in God. He values us so much, it overrides my impatience. It overrides our impatience. The greatest blessing that God can give us sometimes is no. No, because he values us. If my kid says, I want to take the car out and it's a V8 and a lot of power, no, 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 you're not going to take that out. And uh, I remember even though David had his boat license, I wasn't going to give him the keys and straight away and let him take out my 300, 350 uh, horsepower Chevy center mount ski boat with all the power in there. And uh, he couldn't take it until we went out a few times. And I showed him how we had to operate it. I showed him, more importantly, how to clean the thing how to wash the thing, how to look after the thing and how to value its worth. And once he learned that and he says, Dad, can I take the boat out? Sure. And there goes your money. Sure, son. Here, I'll fuel it up. When God works in our lives, he says it's little by little in Deuteronomy. So often we can say things, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of being single. I'm tired of being single. I'm looking this way. I'm tired of being in this situation. I'll give it a year and then I'm done. If God doesn't do things in this amount of time, I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm finished with this. You know, I've learned, do not give God ultimatums. Do not give God ultimatums. He won't leave you to that time. He say, you want to go in 12 months? You just go now then. God cannot be bargained with like that. You can't force his hand. And, you know, I'm tired of what's going on. I'm tired of this season. It just it doesn't seem to bring any fruit. But the Lord says, in due season, you will reap. In due season, you will reap. And nothing can stop it. Nothing can halt it. You will get the victory. But it is little by little. There's an example that I wanted to share. I don't think I've shared this before. I won't tell you the person's name because you'd know them. But I had a, in 2016 when we were pastoring the church and we were coming here and God was starting to move here in the church. And uh, for those who were here early, before Seal and I were coming in here, uh, you guys would know this, that the church went from this small group and all of a sudden, it wasn't momentum yet. This, this Every week we turn up and this was starting to get packed out. And the acceleration and excitement was so amazing. Amazing. And here's the thought that entered my head that I didn't even tell Seal. This is the thought and this is what God did. In my head, I thought, wow, wow, wow. I, I, if I wanted to, if I wanted to, I could just, if I just took this church and broke away and just did my own thing, this thing's going to fly. In my heart, I was just not grabbing all the thoughts. It wasn't something I meditated on. It was a thought that entered my head. And here's what this person said to me. Now, this person was in uh, the previous church with Pastor Ted, and he, he had no issue with them. But this person, I'll be honest, this person wouldn't have stayed there. And this person said this to me. And I said this person later on doesn't remember saying this to me. And this person said to me, you know, you really need to stick with Pastor Ted. Now is not the time to go. Now is not the time to go. And it put me, it was the governor that put me back in check and just put me back and went, okay, I'm going to get that thought out of my head and not even, I didn't even verbalize it to seal. 
But the Lord knew the seed that could have been deposited into my heart. And here's why. This is why God does it. It says in Deuteronomy that you're going to enter in little by little, lest the beasts of the field come after you. This is the beasts of the field. Pride, ego, self-glorification, arrogance, independence from God, independence from the body of Christ. There's a common denominator in the Bible when you read through from all the kings that happen, that when the king's hearts turned, King Uzziah was the classic example that he created instruments of war that stood on the tops of Jerusalem and his fame extended out all across the world. His fame is extended out until he became strong in himself and God removed his hand and he ended up being separated from the nation of Israel because of his leprosy, and he died a leper. Because of the beasts of the field. You see, the beasts of the field, God said, you're not going into the promised land. You're not going to have what you have yet, because if you do, the beasts of the field will devour you. That was using an example of what was happening there to what was hap- would happen in the spirit. They never really succeeded too well in that. And so when we move in God, because he values us, because you are worthy that God says, no, do not allow the beasts of the field to come in. Don't let your pride get above you. You know what happens? I, I know better. I know. I know. You know, the worst thing that can happen for a Christian is, I know. I know. I understand. I've got that revelation. God speaks to me. I know. I've learned I don't. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Eugene, excuse me, off camera, this week, and I was, he was telling me about what we'd spoke about, and I said I was talking about the staff, and he said, yes, he said, actually, he did a message on the staff, and he said, I won't do it when I come to you, and I told him what I did and had everything written down, and he said, did you know that they actually used to write on it and notch it from the bottom up? I said, no, I didn't. I have now. And he wrote every, they write everything from the bottom up. And then he said, here's a scripture that uh, God showed him when he was dealing with this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of his sons, Joseph, each of the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. How do you do that? How would he rest? I mean, Joseph had to, Jacob had to have the staff because his hip was out. So he needed the staff to work. How did he, how did he get the staff? I don't think it was quite as tall as this. But how would he lean on the staff? And he was showing, of course, the, the example of Jacob rest upon the promises of God. And as he learned to rest upon the promise of God, just the very fact that his name Jacob was used and not Israel. Jacob who meant deceiver. Jacob, the one whose name was mud and God redeemed him, shifted things. And then what it says is that when we're leaning on the promises and he stretched his hands out and he blessed the sons of Joseph. He blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. And as he blessed them, he lent upon all that God had done. And as he lent upon all that God has done, he said they start from the ground, from the bottom of the staff upwards so that you're leaning upon the very last thing that God has given you. The very last thing that God has done for you, if you wouldn't mind. Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Are you not of more value than they? Are you of not of more value than the things that come against you? Are you not of more value than any obstacle? Because this God, the lion, the king of kings, the lion of the tribe of Judah, I'm trying to think back as my head, the shout of the king. 
as it was prophesied over Israel, the shout of the king is among you. And don't be put off when things don't move as fast. Don't be put off when things don't go as quick as you would like them to go. Don't be put off when you don't see the breakthrough. Hold fast to the things of God because you lean on Him. You lean on what He says because He values you. He loves you. He, you are worthy in everything. And as you lean on Him, it's releasing the blessing that God has put. It will come in due season, perhaps little by little. Perhaps little by little at times, and other times God will do it instantly. I pray for the instant, but I wait for the little by little. And my prayer so often is, Lord, if there's anything in my life that would hinder anything, if there is any sin in my life, is there anything that would take away, remove it from me, deal with the things in my life, Lord, we need to learn how to repent. We need to learn how to repent, how to turn from our wicked ways. Well, not too wicked, Lord. Yes, we are. We can't even give God sometimes 10 minutes. We can't even give God sometimes extra things. Are we open for what the body of Christ is there to do? Are we open for what the Lord is wanting to bring about? And are you ready to be used even if you're not the one at the front? Are you ready to be a servant in the house of God even when no one even knows your name? Would you do it? Would you do it? Would you serve in the house? Would you serve the king? Would you do something when no one knows your name? The greatest tragedy today is that people don't want to rise. People don't want to lift. And I understand a lot of times why. I understand that things happen in life. But my prayer is that you would find the strength of God. My prayer is that you would find the joy of the Lord in everything you do. My prayer is that you would know him. You would know him. You would know him and have encounters with him, that you would recognize the whispers of the Spirit, that you would recognize the Holy Spirit moving in your life, that you would be woken up in the middle of the night because the Holy Spirit is moving on you, that you would wake up in the morning and before your feet touch the ground, the words that come out of your mouth is, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the God who has done everything for me. Bless the Lord who has looked after me. Bless the Lord and I can walk in him and I will forget not his benefits because he's hand is upon me, not just upon my life, but he is upon my children, that he is upon my grandchildren, he is upon my great-grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. For the Lord says, I will visit my hand upon them to the second and third generation. And his promises in him are yes and amen. And I start each day giving him glory and thanking him for all that he's done. And I said, today, today could be the day where we see your great name go before us and we see your miracle working power what does he require of me? To be a vessel. To be a vessel. A vessel to be used. Can we stand this morning? I do I want to, I do want to challenge you. And I do want to ask you this. You're valued. Next week, we're going to have a message called You Are Not Redundant. It's an amazing message. I'm looking forward to it. Invite people along as Andrina shares the word. I don't ask this because we need and say this because, well, at Momentum, we're just trying to get more people busy. No, that's not my heart and that's not what I'm after. I'm after people that would catch the fire of God. Would you make time for God? Would you make room for God? Would you allow him into your life? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to show you what to put aside, what to pick up? Would you allow the Lord to touch your life? Because there is a, there is a release of the Spirit of God that is about to move over this land. And there is a fire, and I just sense the Lord is about to bring in a revival fire. 
and the revival fire that he is moving across this land will move and smell and taste different from what has been in the past. For God is going to do a new thing and release a new thing upon this land. For God is searching for a people that will love him with their whole heart. God is searching for a people that would be devoted for him, that will be sold out for him, that would yield themselves to the fullness of God. And as these people move, that we will see people move across this land, some with titles, most without. That God would move as he sees fit because his goodness is about to be poured out. His goodness and his great name is about to be poured out. For I see that there is a move of love coming across this nation like never before. For God's hand is about to move and we will see a direct opposition to what the enemy is doing in this land. For God said, I will release, I'm releasing, I'm releasing my anointing. I'm releasing my anointing. Hallelujah. Father, choose us. Choose us. Lord, I just pray for your hand on everyone. I pray your blessing on everyone this morning. And your covering upon them. And Holy Spirit, that we all would just get a deeper revelation that we are valued to you. That we are worthy to you, Lord. And Lord, let our response be in kind. Let our response be in kind to you, O God. So I speak that covering, that blessing upon everyone in Jesus' mighty name. 